prayers. We're heading out tomorrow morning quite early. Well, not early to some of you, but we'll be leaving by 5. We get up and... We are packed already. Well, not from here. We, I, I did think about that. I thought about that, and I thought, well, it's no closer here than it is from Philly, and, and then it would just cost us a hotel room and things like that, and, you know, we're on a fixed budget now. So, just kidding. But we'll be heading down, and we'll be back uh, late Friday, next Friday, and then uh, we'll be back here ready for vacation Bible school. Things are going great. Continue to pray for that. We will. We're still praying for 30 kids. If we get one, that's all. That doesn't matter. If one gets saved, the angels in heaven rejoice. Amen. It doesn't matter. So we're excited about the opportunity that's coming up with Vacation Bible School. A lot of work's going into it, so we need a lot of prayer for that there. So you want to get a head start, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and I titled it, No Risk, No Reward. As we... Uh, get to Solomon's journal here as he's getting to the end of his journal. And I came across this story a while back. And it seems like a good story to help me to uh, introduce our study this evening in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And there's an older gentleman who loved to play golf. You would expect nothing less than a golf story as we're getting ready to leave, but he loved to play golf, and however, he was in his early 80s, and his vision was terrible. He had a very difficult time playing golf because he could not see where the ball went. So he always had to have other people play with him, so they, he would hit the ball, and they would tell him where it went, and then he'd go find it, and then continue to play golf, and one day, the elderly gentleman came to uh, show up to play golf, and unfortunately, all of his golfing buddies canceled on him. So he was sitting there, and he was quite de dejected, and we came, uh, got a little upset, to be honest with you. And, uh, it was a beautiful day for golf. He really wanted to play, but he wasn't going to get the opportunity to play, and Finally, another elderly gentleman came into the clubhouse and saw him sitting over in the corner all depressed, and he said, what's wrong? And the man explained his predicament. He said, I was really looking forward to playing golf today with my buddies, but I, I don't see well anymore, and I really can't see the golf ball, and so I need somebody to watch while I hit the golf ball. The second elderly gentleman, who was actually older than this man, he said, now look, he said, I have perfect eyesight. He said, I can see like an eagle. I would be happy to play golf with you, and I will watch where your ball goes. The man was excited, so they got out on the first tee, and the old man got up, and he hit the ball right down the middle. And he looked over at the other older, older gentleman, and he said, hey, did you see it? And the guy said, yeah, I watched it until it stopped rolling. The older man said, well, that's great. Where did it go? The other older man said, gee, I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> oh. Best laid plans don't always work out. They just don't always work out the way we planned it. And that's a reality with every one of us have to face every day. And then I'll wait for that, and it will be done in a second day. But that's all right. Listen, that happens. <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't mine. But the question is, it happens all the time with us. And with that being the case, how should we live when we're not sure how things are going to turn out? Because none of us have, you know, listen, again, like I said, none of us can see around corners. None of us can see tomorrow. We have no idea. We need to do things because no, knowing that we don't really know how it's going to turn out. And here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, Solomon says, now listen here, folks, don't play it safe. Don't be afraid to take risks. In other words, live confidently. You can't live in a bubble because life isn't going to cooperate it's like, it's like saying here, well, I, I can never get married because I'm going to guarantee that there's going to be struggles at times. 
And, uh, or I can't start that business because what happens if it fails? I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to drive to North Carolina more. What happens if we get into an accident? You can't live like life like that. We can't live life like that. I can't do that ministry because what happens if, what happens if nobody shows up? What happens if? And again, if a person lives with that mentality, they will never accomplish anything. None of us will. So here, here, I'm going to give you a quiz, and I know I didn't, uh, this is a a pop quiz, but I'm going to give you a a hint. I'd like you to finish this verse, and you say it out loud. Are you ready? The just shall live by Faith. 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 Good. Okay, good. Now you can go back to sleep. (laughs) <laughs> but seriously, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. I still believe that with all of my heart that God wants every one of us to continue this life walking by faith. I believe that with all my heart, and I'll believe that till God takes me home or whatever. The just shall live by faith. And Solomon is going to encourage us today as he writes in his journal here some sound advice for us to consider. He gives us two very helpful hints on how we can continue to walk by faith, even uh, at our age now, those of us who may be over 39. He's going to tell you, here's the two things I've given you ahead of time. Diversify your investments, you've heard that before, and seize the opportunity. That's what Solomon has for us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. So, first off, diversify your investments. Right away, your mind is going to your 401k or something like that. But I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Let's pray together. Father, again, Lord, as we have an opportunity to look into your word, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to maybe uh, understand this passage uh, as Solomon intended. So we need your help to do that. Would you take your spirit and help us as we study your word this evening, Lord, to uh, get a, a, a good glance as Solomon is writing his journal and we get a chance to read it. Would you help us to learn from it tonight? Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it may surprise you that Solomon is offering some financial counsel as he nears the end of his journal here. But as we have discussed numerous times in the study of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is a book that is really just down and dirty, nitty-gritty, relevant for each and every one of us, for our lives. And in these first two verses, Solomon says this. He says, since life is so uncertain... Spread your financial investments around. And you're saying, oh, Rick, this is supposed to be a Bible study. And I said, well, this is what Solomon's saying here. He says, cast thy bread upon the waters. What in the world does that have to do with life? If you are like me, and when you read something like that without digging into it, I'm, my mind says, if I cast my bread upon the water, I'm going to have soggy bread the seagulls are going to eat it, and my mom is going to be upset with me for playing with my food. You know, that's what I think. I'm reading here, cash. What does that mean? What does that mean? Until you start to look into it. What's that? You, could, you can. I was going to try to point it out for you, but you, you got one? Sends his rain overseas for after many days you will bitterly turn. There you go. Okay, well, we just close in prayer. No. <laughs> No, no, but again, the point is the word cast helps us to understand it a little bit better. Yeah, cast, we're thinking about fishing, cast, cast, and that that word can also be translated send. The verb itself refers to like a commercial enterprise of the sea trade, which we know Solomon had a very significant navy, a very significant uh, fleet of, of vessels. 
Uh, he was very successful, and it had brought him great profit. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 22 says, For the king, talking about Solomon, had, a, had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Haram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So he, I mean, he was significant. Solomon had many, many ships to carry the grain to sell to other countries. And we would say this, as, as, as we talk financial, we would say, listen, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify your portfolio. You know, whether you're 25 or 75, don't put everything in Enron. Okay, don't do that. You know, it's just poor financial well, that was stupid financial, but that wasn't no fraud. That was criminal. But anyhow, let's move on. But there are people that will tell you, instead of putting your, your grain in a ship, you ought to just keep it yourself and make all the bread for yourself. And you know what happens when you keep all of the grain for yourself and you make, and you make bread? You know what you have left? Milk. Bread. That's all you have is bread. He says, cast it upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. There's no risk if I keep it to myself and I just make bread, but then it's going to get moldy, like you said, Steve. It's just going to get stale bread. That's what I'm going to have left. I've got no return on my investment. Obviously, when you send your grain across the seas, there's risks involved. There's, there's pirates. There's what? Putin might get it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, maybe. Pirates, storms, whatever. There's so many different things. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, but there are also the prospects of receiving a return on my investment. Instead of just hiding it under my mattress, I send it overseas to get a return on my investment to sell whatever it is. There's a lot of things that we don't know. But uh, as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, it's repeated over and over again. But here in, in, in verse 2, Solomon puts it this way. He said, divide your portion to seven or even to eight because you just never know what kind of trouble is going to come. You just never know. And in fact, the words, for thou knowest not, it's common theme in, the verse of, in Ecclesiastes here when he talks about it in verse 2, thou knowest not. But this one thing we do know. Here it is. Here it is, folks. We know the just shall live by faith. That means I can trust God with every area of my life. Period. Every area. Every area. So here's the lesson for us this evening. Since God alone knows our future, we ought to make our plans. We ought to, we ought to use our brains. We ought to study a situation. We ought to take all of the factors into consideration. We ought to seek wise counsel, do the best we can, and then leave the results to God. God has given us brains, he's given us his word, and he says in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. We ought to just make plans and, and, and then do something about them. I know a lot of people who have a lot of great ideas, who make a lot of plans and do nothing, and they put it under their mattress, hoping that somehow, some way, it's going to get out of their mattress to the rest of the world out there. It's not that way. It doesn't work that way. Don't be foolish, don't be reckless, but... Solomon says, diversify your investments. Spread it around. And that, and that goes for ministry. You know, if we put every, let's be able to use a common thing because this is, this is on our mind right now. If we, listen, our whole year is VBS. And everything we do for the whole year is VBS. And that's a good thing. But it's not the best thing. It's one thing. And then we have another thing to do and another thing to do and another thing to do. Because why? Because we're told to go and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're told to make disciples. And, and, and if, we just do, if we just do VBS, then that we haven't reached our Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Diversify your investments. But secondly, he says, seize your opportunities. In this section here, Solomon says that we cannot delay our course of action. It's like telling you, seize the day, carpe diem, carpe diem, whatever that, uh, uh, seize the day. In, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 3 to 5, Solomon gives some observations concerning the ways that we are to uh, 
go about our life and things, that, and, uh, and then he gives us an application for us to look at. So uh, let's look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 3. It says this, If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Now, again, we know by experience that we cannot predict or control every event that comes into our life. I wish I could. It's just not realistic. But this is a recurring theme in Ecclesiastes. We need wisdom to discern those things that we can do something about and those things that we can't do anything about. We need to understand, and we cannot stop nature's patterns. I can't stop the rain. I can't make it rain. I'm not, you know, I'm not that person. None of us are, the best of my knowledge. So I can't do anything about that. And I can't, I can't do anything about which way a tree falls. It's what Solomon's talking about. You can't, the tree falls to the south, it falls to the north. I can't do anything about it. I'm not even going to try to get a chainsaw out. I'll, I'll lose a couple limbs myself. But you can't, you can't control that. So we better work on finding something better to worry about. And that's what he's talking about. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the tree fall toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree fall, there it's going to be. That's the where it's going to be. The point is simple. Don't waste your time with God's affairs. Don't waste my time with, only th- with things that only God can control. I can't, I, I'm not going to borrow worry. I don't want I don't want to worry about what God is in control of. I got enough things to worry about myself that I can do and control myself. And that's what he's talking about. Don't waste your time with God's affair. Psalm 24, verse 6, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is God's. This is God's. And I'm not going to worry about whether it's raining, whether it's a drought, whether whatever. I, I can't control that. But I can, control, I can control my attitude towards it. I need to stop worrying about the things that I have no control over and never will and leave it all in God's most capable hands. Here it is, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast some of your cares upon him. It doesn't say that. In fact, it doesn't say cast most of your cares upon him. It says all. Casting all of your cares upon him. You know what all means? All means all and that's all all means. And that means I am to take the burdens and the cares and the worries that I'm taking and I'm giving it to someone else who's better able to carry it. Casting all of my cares on him because he can carry it. That's what we're talking about here. Now look at verse 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Again, this proverb criticizes those who are overly cautious. Well, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to go out today because uh, it might rain or we might get a, you know, a, a dusting of snow so I can't go out. I can't, I can't fulfill that ministry or whatever. And that's what this verse is talking about here. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. The farmer who waits for the exact right time to plant when there's no wind and there's no, no clouds out there is not going to have any harvest. It's like, it's like I, 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 anybody here ever hear somebody say, well, we're waiting, waiting for the right time to have kids. Hey, let, let me tell you something. There is no right time to have kids. You'll never be rich enough You'll never have as, uh, the energy that you need. You'll never have the time that you need. If you're going to wait till the right time, you will be empty nesters from marriage. You'll not have them. You can't wait. And that's, and that's what it's saying here. Well, we'll, we'll never do anything. We gotta. Uh, oh, we just. Oh, you know, it's something it might not go right, and we will have no effective ministry. I think what Solomon's trying to tell us here this evening is don't settle for the status quo Christianity. Don't, keep, don't just keep to yourselves. Get involved. And we've, we've talked about this in the past. Get involved. If you're not currently involved in some type of a ministry, don't wait for the best time because there is no best time. Behold, this is the day of salvation. Today is all we got. Boast not thyself for tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. This is the day that the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So this is the day that I have. Let's use it for God. Instead of, oh, John, you John, well, we're pretty busy. Boy, well, yeah, I know, so am I. We all are. But I want to be busy for God. 
And as I, as I said the other day, there's a difference between being busy and being fruitful. The challenge is, what are we? Are we busy or are we fruitful? And that's, a, that's what I think Solomon wants us to get at here. If, we're, uh, if we wait until we're less busy or, or until we have every other area of our life in order, whatever that looks like, because I have never seen that yet, we will never witness, we'll never serve, we'll never see individuals come to Christ, we'll never see a, a, a return our, on our spiritual investments. Seize the opportunities that God has given to us every day that ends in Y. And every day that we have breath. Now look at verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Solomon now, Solomon now is going to make a couple analogies or life comparisons. He mentions that life is very much like the wind. It's unpredictable and it's mysterious. And it is sovereignly operated by God who we can't control. God can control it. But likewise, we cannot understand how God forms the bones. I have no idea how this is done. I don't. I just trust God with it. God forms the bones of that little child in the womb. This is so far beyond my, beyond my comprehension. So I have to take it by faith. And we trust God to form the bones as he sees fit. Every person that was ever born was fearfully and wonderfully made exactly how God wanted them. From inception to death. They are exactly how God wanted them. And I'm not going to go off on a tangent about what's going on in our world right now. But every child is precious in God's eyes, even if it's not born yet. It's very clear that creation of the human body couldn't have happened by chance just oh well it just happened i like how this one scientist his name is fred hoyle he put it this way human life happening by chance is akin to a tornado in a junkyard taking all the pieces of metal lying there and turning them into a boeing 747 <laughs> ain't gonna happen not gonna happen so again I, I we can't know god's activities we take it in faith he is the one who makes all things Folks, I say that to say this. There are times when we look at things that are going on in our world and it just doesn't make a lot of sense to us. As, as I've shared with you before, I, I almost have stopped, I have not completely stopped watching the news, but I, I won't only watch it for a short period of time because it gets me mad. I mean, visibly mad when I'm ready to throw something at the television. That's how upset I get because what's going on in our world. And then I sit back and remember that God's still in control. Nobody has ever pulled one over on God. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he moveth it whichever way he wants to. So I will trust him with it. But too many Christians, they freeze. They freeze because they don't know, they don't know what God wants them to do. I don't know. I mean, I listen, you ever have a, anybody ever say, well, I'm waiting for God to, to show me. We're just praying about it. It's like, okay, well, pray about it and then do something. You can just pray about it. If, if you're looking for a job and you can sit in your, your, your prayer closet forever and ever, amen. But if you don't put a resume out or you don't go looking for a job, I mean, I, I know God could do wonderful things, but it's very likely that you're not going to get anywhere. You got to go do something. So, but I think a lot of believers, they just, the old paralysis by analysis routine is like, well, I, you know, let's, let's analyze this. Let's have a couple more meetings. And I hate meetings. I, I really do. <laughs> they're, they're, especially in the banking world, they were about as profitable as my 401k is right now. But uh, just, I, you know, let's just sit around and talk. No, let, no we got to go do something. You want new business? You got to go get it. You want new converts? We got to go get them. I, I, the best of my knowledge, they're not walking in our doors. And they're not walking in our church at, at Collegeville either. But then, you know, just maybe once in a while. God tells us to go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to deserve all things whatsoever. I'm with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the world. Go. Go. So, folks, we need to pray, we need to plan, and we need to pursue the path that God has for us. Now, for those left or right decisions, God's under no obligation to reveal his will for us. Got, you know, we, we, we will trust him with it. Abraham and Sarah left their home. Now, he was only 75 at the time. She was a paltry in her mid-60s. 
Bible tells us they left everything having no idea where they were going. I mean, now you talk about faith. Having no idea, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, talk about it. You talk about a leap of faith, again. <clears throat> but I would rather take a leap of faith than a leap of doubt. And don't take a jump at all. I love what Corey Ten Boom says. She said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. The key is, do we know him? Do we know him well enough to cast all of our cares on him and trust him with everything? So, okay, so here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Solomon says, you sow in the morning and don't be idle in the evening. Do you know what that means? It means in the evening of our life. So for those of us who are over 39... We can't just sit back and say, well, I'm retired. I'm just going to sit back, watch, you know, watch Jeopardy and, and eat bonbons and then go to bed at 7.30. No, 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 no. Solomon, an older, wiser man, is saying here now, in the evening of your life, don't look for a do not disturb sign to hang on the doorknob of your life. Don't do that. God doesn't want us to do that. Resist the urge to say, I'm retired, leave me alone. I just, I've done my time. I'm, I'm, I'm learning that in real time. Because as you know, I retired, so, so-called retired, a year ago, May. And now I, I, I become one of those people who say, now I'm busier now than when I was working. <laughs> but that's okay. We're just trying to follow the Lord wherever he leads and we can't wait for the conditions to be perfect. We can't wait for things to be free of all risks. And there's going to be some fears and uncertainty. Absolutely. We can't be afraid of failure, but we need to be terrified of regret. I don't ever want to look in the rearview mirror of my life with regret. Oh, I should have done this. We should have done this. We could have done this. I really, I do. I, I envision, our, you know, Shar and I... Meeting the Lord, saying, Lord, here we are. We're still tired. And he's going to say, welcome home, guys. You did a good job. That's what we want. It was John Wayne who once said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. Okay? Just, yeah. Uh, what time I am afraid, I will trust in him. David was afraid. So, so what are we going to do to show the world that we're stepping out on faith? What are, what are we going to do to get out of our comfort zones and take some risks for the kingdom of God? Because we all walk by faith and not by sight. The words to the old course goes like this. How can I do less than to give of my best after all he's done for me? If we think about how much he, it cost him to pay for my sins, how can I do less than to give him my best after all he's done for me? I want to refuse to allow dust to collect on my life. So, folks, I think Solomon is encouraging us to get started today. If we wait for tomorrow, chances are we'll never start. Take that step of faith. I believe, I believe this with my heart. You take a step of faith, you will never regret it. But I do believe if we don't take a step of faith, we will always regret it. Let's pray together. Father, again, Lord, I do. Thank you for the word of God that Solomon has penned for us this evening that we took a look at. And Lord, would you, would you help us? Uh, would you be with us as we uh, continue to serve you to the best of our abilities? Would you show us maybe what we can do better? Would you show us what maybe we could do something different? Uh, Lord, just, or just encourage us with what we're doing, what we're doing for you. We just want to do what you have for us. We want to make you look good. So I pray now that you continue to be with us through the, the prayer time this evening. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.